Hi, everybody, and welcome to The What Now with Jeff Weber. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about the show. Uh, my guests come from all corners of the music business and the entertainment space as we examine careers and perspectives from the inside out. To have a career in our business takes a lot more than simply being amazing at what you do. And with the world and our business being in such a swirling cyclone of trepidation, uncertainty, and outright speculation, we try to answer the question on all of our minds. What now? And speaking of that, I am super delighted to welcome Brian Ross to our podcast. Um, Brian is uh, amazing because in the San Diego and Orange County area, he's well known for promoting and producing shows and events. And I have to admit that of all of, of uh, the people in our business, if you do put on a live show, we're in trouble right now. <laughs> when you say, I mean, it went from, from 60 to zero in overnight almost. Uh, tell, tell me a little bit about the shows that you've done in the OC and in San Diego. What type of, of music, what type of shows, what type of venues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, my genres in terms of talent buying, booking, venue management uh, really cover the full spectrum. So everything from uh, Jamaican reggae to uh, world-class jazz to uh, fusion rock to um, uh, mainstream hip-hop, uh, really the full spectrum uh, is, is what I love, if it's talent, especially right. if it's a, a virtuoso or just something that is up and coming, emerging, then that's really exciting to me. So artists like Hyrie uh, out of San Diego, artists like Is There a Vibration, um, uh, English Beat did all that just within the last year. Uh, that was coming through Newport Beach, uh, but but have have done a lot. I've worked in different venues and spectrums: uh, Smashing Pumpkins, John Legend, uh, Death Cab for Cutie, uh, Jack Johnson at Remac Field in 2005, and have worked with with a lot of uh, partnerships with with the major promoters. So hmm. Nederlander and uh, Live Nation. So, so how does that work? Do you? Mm -hmm. So do you approach them or they approach you because you're local and you know the ins and the outs? And a, a, a lot of what was happening was very much in partnership. And for 13 years, I was at UC San Diego. Ah, okay. So at UC San Diego, I was able to do everything from 200-person uh, pubs and you know smaller concerts all the way up to Remac Arena and Remac Field. And a really good thing about UCSD while I was there was um, I was the campus events manager. And um, I was under the uh, uh, director of art power in, in campus events. Uh, we had a non-exclusive clause. So we would have a Live Nation or a Nederlander or an AEG or um, uh, uh, a range of promoters come through. Um, there wasn't an exclusivity. And that also allowed the campus and the students and myself to produce shows independently uh, without us being blocked out of our own venues. Right. So, and a lot of that is in tribute to Don Chadwick, who is the director of, of the facility operations. Hmm. He came over to UCSD from San Diego State, and he knew not to give the campus an exclusivity clause. He really wanted to avoid that type of deal. So what it meant is you had a range of uh, national promoters uh, that would work with my office, and um, I would represent the university, and we were able to do a host of a lot of exciting stuff now, of course, as promoters started to uh, consolidate, and then eventually the whole agent industry business right. started to consolidate, it became tougher. And because we didn't have exclusivities, shows became less. And, uh, you know, none of this is ever easy. <laughs> right. But um, a lot of experience came from being able to work with a lot of different national promoter styles. But that was about 10, 15 years ago. The last uh, a few years or so, a lot of what I've been doing is more um, independent talent buying and show production. Uh, so what I just mentioned, um, Hyrie, Is There a vib Vibration, um, uh, a range of different shows that are happening in Newport Beach, those were those were either with a partnership um, through a, a buddy in Orange County or they were independently produced shows. So in, in those type of independent shows, who pays the freight? Do you front, mm -hmm. front, you front the... You know, there's there's an art and a science and a timing and um, and all of that to talent buying. Right. And uh, so uh, I've been talent buying for about twenty years. And and all so the, you have a good a good temperature gauge when it comes to that. Exactly. Really, really, what you have to do is um, is 
is have a sense of, of what's current and how you can um, compete with other venues and how you can offer something which um, doesn't step on toes but is still opportunistic to the artist and to you and, and really get the deal done on the front end. Get everything in the offer um, and make sure that things are squeaky clean and understood uh, with, a, with a good settlement so that you're on to the next show. That's amazing. So uh, that that you would kind of risk your own funds and and of course reap the rewards. Too, oh well, but- to clarify, um, uh, I I no not using my own funds, uh, 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 using uh, the funds of of who I'm working for, the company I'm working for. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. So it would be Music Box fund, funds. Let's say it would be UCSD funds. It would be Newport Dunes Waterfront Resort funds. Got it. And it's making sure that the shows are profitable. Or at least the food and beverage is profitable. <laughs> do you do you resort to because uh, you've done this for so long, so you, you kind of have an innate sense. But do you resort to uh, like a publication like uh, Polestar, for example, which Absolutely. gives you kind of uh, attendance averages? Polestar is great, but um, you know, like any statistician will say, the information is only as good as it's being reported, or you Correct. know, it's based on the opinion of the statistician. But I love Polestar. I love the Polestar um, uh, uh, conventions. I've, I've, I've been a member and uh, uh, really love the information Polestar provides. And at UCSD, I used to teach students to really pay mm-hmm. attention and use Polestar and understand, for one thing, it's a stat, and it's based on the information reported. And also sometimes in the early days, if your show taint, you're going to report that. Or if you're on the management side and your show oh, right. sold out, you're going to report that. Right. So be careful about what the information is. But um, really, you've got to have an ear to the ground as well. And and you got to know what's up and coming. Do you kind of use uh, the research to determine a fair fee structure? or You can definitely argue that. Um it, it does help, but as, as everyone knows, markets are different. Um, uh, competitors provide different pressures. Um, sometimes uh, you want to overpay an artist in order to get the show done. Sometimes you want to come in under. Sometimes um, there's so many variables on a per show basis. It's really a fast moving, um, uh, you know, it's, it's playing numbers. So... Do, I assume that you there are radius restrictions, uh-huh. uh, and f- for those of you who don't know, uh, I wonder if the radius restrictions goes into Los Angeles because uh, you know you're restricted, an act is restricted from performing within a certain amount of mm-hmm. miles. Usually, it's 100, 150 miles of the venue that you want, so they can't they may lose a gig in Los Angeles if. Yeah. So a good thing is is knowing <clears throat> your radius clauses and knowing. Um, where you are from various different venues and watching what those various different venues are doing and staying in regular contact with agents and knowing where there's openings. But a good thing would happen in Orange County whereby um, often what I would find is uh, we would get a Saturday that maybe normally would go to San Diego. And a lot of that just had to do with a preference of playing that market because, you know, it might be Anaheim and Huntington Beach and Los Angeles and the different areas that you could draw from. Uh, was 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 giving advantage for what I was doing in in Orange County, but radio clauses are extremely important, and um, also uh, greedy agents and not caring about radius clauses and still booking is very important. And typically, what you would find is that if you've got the venue and the artist wants to play it, you work with the artist, you work with the management, you work with the agent, you work with the other venues, and the show still happens, provided you're at least fifty miles out. Fifty. It right. used to be 60. It used to be 120. Um, but, you know, some very interesting things would happen. Like you would see traditionally the 60 or 90 mile radius clause. Then all of a sudden, I remember two or three years ago, um, Al Miola came through and and played a ton of shows in Los Angeles and Orange County and played a show in San Diego. And all of them were right next to each other. And everybody was wondering what the heck was was going on. I think most of them sold well. And then you see that with different artists. Um, English Beat, we booked it last year. There are shows stacked all over on top of each other. He plays up and down the coast. Hmm. Just about every show did well. Hmm. So some of it, too, has to do with the marketing formula, the day of the week, just going for it. Um, the uh, the network of clubs 
understanding each other enough, but easier said than done because absolutely booking talent buying is one of the most stressful, challenging, expensive, difficult things. And when you step on the wrong toes and it's going to happen, it hurts. And uh, so it's, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy biz. The way I look at it is uh, you as a talent buyer, you're juggling so many different variables. Exactly. You know, yeah. and it's, it's just uh, anything that falls through your fingers can devastate the event. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, man, oh man, I, 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 I know how difficult it is because I'm a festival and concert producer myself. Yeah. Uh, but the idea of, of buying talent, uh, so that the show is profitable, so that you don't piss off other clubs that are right in the, and that you don't piss off the act, and that you don't, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. So given the fact that that's what you've done for 20 years, mm -hmm. what now for you? Uh, more of the same. <laughs> but what I really am excited about right now is uh, live streaming. Yeah, let's talk about that. So uh, you were talking about Polestar, and I've been going over their charts. Right now, because no one's doing live performances and there aren't ticket sales, what they're consistently doing on a weekly basis is they're listing the top 50 live streams. So how, did, who reports that? Or do um, they do the research themselves? Going back to the stats, um, it really depends on who wants to report it. For instance, I don't know if much of the jam band scene or, or certain you know level right. acts are reporting it, but the numbers I'm seeing are very impressive. Um, country on the live stream charts, it's topping it consistently right. over and over again. Also what's happening in, in the live stream charts is maybe people that had fallen off the typical chart five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago are having a revolution. Hmm. And I think it's because of their inspiration. It, it, it has to be because of the quality of the live stream, um, although not necessarily. Uh, but but what I'm seeing in the live stream market, to give an example, is uh, the top five to ten artists in terms of views per show. Views per show are up to um, 600 to a million to two million per show. Views per show. For instance, Nora Jones is averaging per show on a weekly basis on a Thursday, one show per week. 500 to 600,000 views. Is it pay-per-view? Uh, it's She's doing it. She's been doing it off of her Facebook. Now, oh, that wow. is That's... six times the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Correct. 500, 600,000 on one night. That's unbelievable. And now she's been doing that month after month, week after week. Uh, you've got other things happening where a single country artist is doing 1.6 million views or or. 2.2 million views off of Facebook live. Um, oh. Some of them are doing off of Facebook live. Uh, Bob Weir did something recently. It was on Instagram. I, it, again, it was up in the, you know, uh, uh, top hundred thousands. Um, so there's different platforms hmm. being used. There's not that many proprietary platforms just yet. Then in terms of the proprietary stuff, and, and you know, the, the, these are the things that I'm, I'm very excitedly looking into. You're getting, a range of people who have been doing the streaming for quite some time, and these are companies with a legit portfolio, hmm. and and they've been in business. Uh, I believe no cap, for instance, since uh, you know the the mid two thousands, two thousand seven, or, wow. or and and then you've got um, this company Live by Live, which um, oh yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, has has been um, uh, uh, doing this for quite some time. So you have legit companies with very solid portfolios. Then you have a lot of cowboys jumping into the mix. You've got a lot of artists and managers self-creating and self-producing and jumping into the mix. So you've got this uh, a cacophony or, or you know, a, a stew of all kinds of things coming into the fold, as well as some guy in his pajamas on a rocking chair in his bedroom wearing underwear live streaming. Do you think people are going to pay for this? Well... Um, the jam band community, especially 10 years ago, I was watching Phil Lesh or Fish or, you know, some version of the dead and it would be a holiday weekend or New Year's Eve and I'd be home or sick in bed and I'd be paying 20, 30, $35 to watch Phil Lesh or the dead or Fish on a holiday weekend. So that's been extremely lucrative. And that's what, what I think is opening up is I think what COVID did is it took that platform it took that um, uh, a need and it, it forced it at an earlier time. And if you can think about it in some ways, um, if, 
if you can get an artist in a 200 or 400 or 1,000, 1,500 person room, but you can live stream, your capacity now triples or quadruples um, provided the artist can pull that type of, of range. Right. Another thing that I'm seeing, which is really exciting, um, two things. One is most of the artists that are maybe drawing in the 100 to 200 range, uh, they're playing the nightclub circuit. Uh, they're, it seems like their live streams are consistently pulling in that same number mm. to some extent, but it's also pulling in mom and dad from the East Coast, mm. brother or sister who moved to Europe, a uh, cousin who's in Canada, a uh, fan out of the blue who's calling in from Africa or, or, or somewhere else in the world. So all of a sudden their normal show is expanding uh, more than expected. And that is happening more recently. I think when COVID first started, uh, it just wasn't that trusted or people were a little sick of it or bored of it and it was everyone in their uh, pajamas. But another thing that's happening is it really provides an opportunity to almost produce a video and and really kind of take the live performance uh, video concept to a new level. Uh, and, and I would love if it could almost even integrate um, a lot of the video stardom that was, that was in the 80s when MTV was coming out. Right. And everyone had a theme and had fun with videos. And, right. And uh, that quite hasn't happened yet with the live streaming, but it should. I imagine that when the production value is increased to the point where they they can do that, uh, it will. Uh, so, uh, so you're still. I mean, even though uh, you know our industry has kind of fallen flat, you're still aggressively pursuing the live streaming. I know you've done some shows in the area, mm -hmm. and uh, are. Are you surviving? Well, first thing, yeah. Uh, first things first was to make sure that we built up our production and our inventory. And that happened very quickly. The team mm. that Intertalk Florentino has put together um, is really doing something above the the, the norm. Uh, the live switch is good. The number right. of cameras, the number of mobile cameras, um, the um, editing, the sound mixing, the live tracking. So what I'm talking about is, is not what quite a few people are doing. Uh, you know, here's my iPhone. Um, here's me Heavy in my living room. live production. <laughs> yeah, no. And that's fantastic. so I think that is where the, the money is in the production quality because that is in demand. If you're an artist and it's COVID and you're trying to figure out if you're going to do a holiday show this November, December, or what in the heck are you going to do? You want to come to Intertalk and... You, you want quality production. You want to come to InterTalk. You want somebody who knows how to switch a camera and make sure that your <clears throat> streamed mix is for a live stream. Uh, it's your, your sound recording quality level is for a live stream, not a room. Uh, and so getting all of those variables right, very important. Right. But, and, and, and so the COVID in a way has kind of expanded your horizons in a, Kind of weird yeah, it, it, it's like I mentioned. Um, I, I think it's taking the live streaming concept and it's said to a promoter, "Hey, you got two, you got a two hundred person room, not with live streaming. You have an infinite room." Right. Hey, you got a festival. It's called Coachella and it's sold out. Coachella has been live streaming, so Coachella takes three days, two weekends of completely sold out shows and doubles or triples right. or yeah. whatever is going yeah. on. Uh, Fish is selling out their their. Right. Weekend shows, whatever it might be, boom, they're live streaming and selling all of that. So I guess we are hopeful. We should be hopeful that, you know, what's happening now is going to do when we all get back to the new abnormal is just going to explode. I hope so. I I hope it, uh, you know, for one thing, we, we, we like being together. Right. We like being in a crowd and cheering and eating popcorn and Absolutely. drinking beer and being in the front row and yeah. seeing what's going to happen next. I think it's amazing. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Well, I, I, I really want to follow you, your career and, and shucks, maybe we can work together on something. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, it's what you're doing here. I think more people need to know about. I think that the, the you're engaging and, and you understand the market and you understand the bullshit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's, it's a great thing. And I'm glad to hear that you're thriving. You know, <laughs> certainly having fun, uh, thriving. Uh, no, um, uh, receiving a paycheck, not necessarily loving what I'm doing. 
passionate about what Thriving I'm doing. Thriving in that area. Absolutely. Seeing openings and, and opportunities and, and new things unfold. Absolutely. But you'll be there when all the other stuff catches up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a good thing to keep the eye on. The fact that Polestar, their top weekly chart is all live streams. It's amazing. Says something very important about yeah, what's happening should, right now. We should really pay attention. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being a guest on this show. You've educated me and you've educated me. <laughs> you know, but I, I love having you here and hopefully we can do this again you Thanks. Know, because uh, when this is over, you'll have new stories to tell. Great. I want to hear them. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeffrey. All right. It's been a pleasure. Awesome.